is Mr. and Mrs. Turan. We are going to have a conversation about how fentanyl has affected their lives. Good morning, Ms. Turan. Mr. Turan, how are y'all doing today? Good morning. We're doing well. Thank you for having us here today. So you are an angel mom. Can you explain what that is? So basically, the angel moms, we are um, grieving mothers of, and fathers, because there's plenty of fathers out there too, um, who are raising awareness um, with the memory of our children um, about the dangers of fentanyl um, and opioid um, poisonings and overdoses. Um, we basically, that's our, our strength is that we're able to get up, you know, and, and not keep our kids' memory alive and with their memory, share their story and hopefully save others, others' lives. And educate, and educate of course. So your family has lived a parent's absolute worst nightmare? Yes, we have, unfortunately, yes. I'm gonna go ahead and ask our first question. Ms. Turan, will you describe your son's personality and what made him special? He was always very active since he was little. Um, he was a fast learner. Um, he he just he was just a loving kid since he was little. Um, he made a lot of connections since the little age with all sorts of ages. Um, he played football. Uh, we put him in the sport of football because he was so hyperactive that we needed him to like burn off that energy. So um, during that time, he grew very very passionate about. Uh, football and we just kept them going all the way up to high school and throughout his life I mean he showed um, that he was capable and he loved the sport so much that he was very um, how do you say it <sighs> he was just incredible he was just incredible and he loved to, to I wouldn't want to call him a show off, but he knew his talent and he knew what, he, he liked to, to impress. He liked to impress his parents, his family, so family, friends, everybody, we would all gather for his games, um, even through high school. Um, Mama Janice, <laughs> sitting out there, she's one of his top fans. <laughs> um, her family, you know, he was very known at the high school especially for his athletic abilities. So you brought some memorabilia so that we may be able to know him a little better. Can you describe what's on our back table back there? Most of those pictures are, the first table is his jersey um, and his letterman that he earned while he was in, in high school. He worked very hard, pushed very hard for what he wanted. Um, most of those pictures are pictures of him during games with family, you know, with friends that he he met along and kept really close to his friends and family uh, with. And then there's another portion of the table with more of our family pictures. His brother, um, Ethan Turan and Maya Turan, um, grandma, um, our family that loved him very much. And um, that's pretty much everything that's out there. His scholarship, <laughs> um, Waldorf University scholarship that he earned for football and his high school diploma. What were the early warning signs of Matthew's drug addiction? So when Matthew went off to Waldorf University after graduating high school, um, it's when COVID hit. So there was like no telling if the football, uh, college football, was gonna proceed with games and any of that. So they basically canceled the season um, and they gave them the opportunity to do online classes until they resolved anything or had any answers for them. So he was very discouraged by that because he worked very hard for his scholarship. Um, so coming home that first semester, he came home to do online classes at home. And um, I just noticed the change in him. Like I, I could tell that he was sad, you know, mainly sad. So. As the months progressed, like I noticed him deteriorating more. Um, he seemed sad. 
Um, he seemed unmotivated. And Matt's always been active, hyperactive, physically active, the gym, playing basketball. He's just his demeanor, how he was. And for me to notice, us to notice, you know, the downfall on that, I thought he was going through depression. That was my first thought. Which was definitely a natural, uh, there were so many people that were depressed during yes. COVID. We were shut down and isolated, so that, that's understandable. And then as the year progressed, um, closer to the, I think towards the beginning or middle of 2021 is whenever, um, you know, we had to dig into what was going on because he wasn't being as open as normal, not very conversative with us. He just wanted to be either isolated or away from home. Um, so, of course, me as a mother, you know, and knowing the type of relationship I had with my son, I started investigating, um, started looking at his social media, um, and eventually and sadly I ran into um, some videos of other kids that he would hang out with um, actually using fentanyl. And that's, was that on Facebook? It was on a, one of the social media platforms. I think it was either Instagram or Snapchat, one of those two. Um, and that's how I found out that they were involved with a little blue pill because I could clearly tell what it was on the on the uh, video and I immediately started researching um, to see what it was and when I read articles about it it was it would just pop up as like a perk set for it's an opioid you know to help with pain but it's usually prescribed so I knew you know it was not something that was prescribed to any of them. Which brings me to my next question about fentanyl can you describe what fentanyl is and how it contributed to Matthew's death? Fentanyl is a, it's used in the medical field and it's a controlled medication, a controlled medication. So out in the streets, it's being used to lace um, Percocets, Xanax, Adderall, and from what we know also um, Marijuana is being laced, and from what I believe and I've heard is also the vapes are being laced with fentanyl. And if it's not, it's it's addictive. For one, it's addictive, and for two, it's lethal. It's it can kill you the, the right amount, or the, the right amount can kill you instantly. Yeah, it doesn't take much. And it doesn't take much. True, it does not take much. How has your life changed since Matthew's death? It's changed a lot. We're still in that fresh grieving stage. Next month will be a year since he passed. Um, but physically and emotionally, me personally, it has had a major impact. Um, I've suffered a lot of um, nervous breakdowns, um, been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, my health just completely declined after after his loss. Um, as far as my family, I mean, as you can tell by all the pictures back there, my son was loved by everybody that he met. And we all still suffer to this day, and we gather together to remember him as much as possible. But it's impacted everybody. His loss has made a major impact on all of us. This is our last question. What is the message you want students to learn from Matthew's passing? The main message is don't do drugs. Don't fall for peer pressure. The drugs that are out in the street are actually lethal and just one pill, just like my son, just one pill can kill you. And it's not worth it. It really isn't worth it. Not for a young life, y'all still have a lot. A future ahead of y'all. And me as a parent, as a mom, my husband, as a father, it hurts to lose someone that was so special to you. Thank you, Ms. Tran, Mr. Tran, for being here today and sharing your story, because this is very difficult. Our deepest, absolute deepest condolences.
we do want to thank you for just being so brave because this was very difficult. But not just that, it's, it's scary too, to get up and talk, tell your story in front of people. So thank you so very much. Thank you for having us. We have one more guest speaker this morning. Um, that is Mr. Mike Land from Texas Against Fentanyl. Good morning, everyone. Um, Oscar and Myra, I love you guys. Um, I wasn't supposed to cry. Um, you saved a life today by talking about Matthew. And that's what we have to do every day is get up and share, share our children's story. Um, and you're probably like me, you said the same thing, it won't happen to me. And that's what we all think. And it happened in a little town like this. Most people think it just happens in the big cities. It doesn't, it's everywhere. Um, I'm gonna just start off a little bit about me real quick and how I came about with Texas Against Fentanyl. I was that person three years ago on January 5th that got a phone call. And I don't share this story much, but I was watching a documentary called The Pharmacist on Netflix. And it was about the opioid catastrophe that had happened. And the person, the pharmacist, his son had just been killed by a drug dealer. And I looked at my best friend and I said, I couldn't imagine if I lost Preston. And the reason I brought that up is because I lost my youngest son in 2005. And I'm gonna try and do this without crying. But right after I said that, my phone rang. And I got a call from my ex-wife saying that Preston was gone. She found him dead up in McKinney, Texas. So I never thought it would happen to me. And I never thought it would happen twice. But I know that God gives us a purpose each day to get up and share that story because we're saving a life. So I applaud you guys for getting up and standing up and sharing your story because it makes a difference. You know, it's, my son died, it'll be four years in January. There's 600,000 parents like us out there that have lost a child. And you bring family members, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, there's six million victims out there right now that are suffering this consequence. So thank you for letting me share about my son. Um, I teamed up with Texas Against Fentanyl because I was that crazy father that thought he was gonna go out there and change the world, shut the border down. You know, I probably yelled at every law enforcement agency, every politician to do whatever I possibly could. I was gonna be the guy that could do it. One thing I decided I would do is actually go out there and make awareness. It's the only thing that I could do. Preston was 25 years old and he had just gotten back from Big Bend National Park. So I decided I'm gonna go to 25 national parks and raise awareness. I went to 25 national parks in nine months. I rode my bike seven miles in each park and climbed to the tallest peak and did a memorial for my son. And the, the reason I'm gonna bring this up is every parent that was out there would ask me the same question, what are you filming? And I said, I'm bringing awareness about the fentanyl crisis. And every parent said the same thing, thank God my kid's not a drug addict. And I would say, then you're the person I wanna talk to. Because most of the people that are dying are first time users. And second, if they're a drug addict, no one's chose to become a drug addict. No, I've still never met one person today that is happy that they became addicted to drugs. And they didn't deserve to die. And this fentanyl that's on the streets, it is, it's, it's not a drug, it's a poison. And like you said, Myra, if it's administered by a physician, it's administered as a drug. And it's administered in mil uh, micrograms. So with that being said, I got a call from the DEA and I think it was Chip Roy, one of our congressmen, and they said, you need to team up with Texas Against Fentanyl. So I did. I teamed up with Stephanie Turner, she's our founder, and her mission was the same thing. She lost her son just a few months after mine, Tucker, and she basically wanted to go out there and do the exact same thing, talk to schools, bring awareness about the fentanyl crisis. First thing they said was, you need to start a nonprofit if you want to do that. So she did. Next thing you know, she teamed up with Greg Abbott and some other parents, and they passed the law in the state of Texas that Texas has to have curriculum from the 6th to 12th grade about fentanyl education. They also passed the murder charge. So now that if you intentionally sell or give someone fentanyl, you will go to prison. The other thing is they actually brought about October being you know, Fentanyl Awareness Month in the state of Texas. 
So Stephanie, myself, and about six other mothers were area directors throughout the state of Texas, and we do this every day. We go out there and we speak to schools, we speak to whoever will listen. And as I said again, you made one difference today by saving one life. And I've talked to four people, I've talked to 400, I've talked to 4,000 people. And focus on making the message to one person that they make, that it's aware about fentanyl. One of you guys is going to go home today and tell this story and you're going to save a life, I guarantee it. These are some pictures of Matthew. I know that you've got more back there, but just wanted to share. It just... He's right about my son's age, and, and then I found out he was a cowboy fan, so that made it even better. So, I uh, just want to let you know, as little guys know a little bit about fentanyl. Fentanyl is 50 times more powerful than heroin. It is also 100 times more powerful than morphine. It is sold illegally through laced counterfeit pills, vapes, marijuana, cocaine, meth, heroin, and even candy, and I'm glad you brought up the vapes. I, I do a lot of talks with DEA agents and U.S. attorneys, and they always have the slogan, one pill can kill. And I said, throw that sign away, because it's one try you die, because it is in everything now. My son's high school, there was a SRO that caught a vape pen with a girl, and she had fentanyl in that vape pen, and she was arrested with a felony. And in, we had, in Austin, about six months ago, we had 80 overdoses in seven days of marijuana-laced fentanyl. Eight of those people died. Three grains of salt, and you mentioned that, it's a minute amount. Two milligrams, which is, if you've ever seen the picture of a pencil with a little, couple of little grains of salt, that's two milligrams of fentanyl. My son had 12 milligrams of fentanyl, and he bought a Percocet. There was no Percocet in his system, it was just 12 milligrams. He died in 72 seconds. Why teens might be tempted, you brought up COVID. All of us at Texas Against Fentanyl, all of our children died the same year. All males, all in the same age group. Why? Because COVID happened. And they were depressed, isolated. They were hurting. They weren't having their normal life and they wanted to take something to feel better. And I'm not saying anybody was mentally diagnosed with anything. It's just situational that somebody's depressed and isolated. I was the same way when my son died. I was just telling you earlier, you know, somebody said, you need to get on antidepressants. And I said, well, I'm not clinically depressed. I'm just situationally depressed. And we all go through that. And I, I'd like to especially speak to the kids right now. You guys are our biggest ambassadors out there right now. Because I know kids with cell phones, if your parents text you, a lot of the times you're probably not going to answer it. But you, if your friends are having a bad day, text them. Just see how they're doing. Because you could save a life. Because we are seeing a lot of our family, we didn't find our children dead at a party or on the streets. We found them dead down the hall in our house, by themselves, not at a party. So these kids, something's wrong. They need to be helped. And just talk to these kids, please. Don't take medications not prescribed to you. Do not buy pills and drugs from social media and have a pre-planned response to say no. One of those pre-planned responses just say, my parents drug test me. I'm in sports, whatever you want to say. My next door neighbor's a cop and he doesn't like me so he's gonna drug test me, whatever that is. Make up an excuse. Um, I, I like to bring up that don't take medicine not prescribed to you. A lot of people will say, if you're not getting a pill from your doctor, your parent, or, or a pharmacy, don't take it. Only one of those is true, the pharmacy. Don't take a pill from your parent because what if I'm a parent and I got a laced pill somewhere and it's up on the shelf. The blue pills that everybody sees, the M30s, the blue Percocets, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals stopped making those in 2019. So they're not even on the streets anymore. That, so whatever you find out there is illegal or maybe it's been in grandma's cupboard for 30 years. Um, I do wanna bring up before I get into the next slide, um, I had to take notes because I'm kind of old. Um, I brought up the 600,000 parents. That's a mom and a dad for the 300,000 people that have died since my son died January 5th of 2021. If you total up the Vietnam War, the Afghan War, the Iraqi War, doesn't even come close to that number of people. Every 4.8 minutes in the United States, somebody dies of a drug overdose. 
and 76% of those are fentanyl related. This is a war that we are in right now. I also want to bring up that these numbers are actually very low. And the reason I bring that up is the autopsy situation. There's a lot of times that a parent will take a child to the hospital when they've overdosed. And when you overdose at the hospital sometimes, you're under doctor's care, so they don't need to do an investigative autopsy. We estimate the number is probably about 20% lower than it is of what we're losing. There's 4,000 students, Wesley was telling me, in this school district. That's how many people we lose every one and a half weeks in the United States. It's the fastest growing, or it is the, the leading cause of death from 18 to 50 now. It's the fastest growing cause of death from the age of zero to 17. And you might ask, an infant. How is an infant getting fentanyl? I was just telling them about the story with Texas Pictures. They had a three-year-old who was crawling on the floor. A, a friend came over to watch a football game. They dropped a pill on the ground, just that little speck. The baby inhaled it and died. So that's how they're dying. They're not taking a drug or anything like that. The next slide is about Narcan. I will say that I got off the phone with the CDC and the head of the DEA last week or the week before. The fentanyl deaths have actually come down in the United States, except for one state, Texas. The other thing that we want to notice is that even though the, the cause of deaths have gone down, the poisonings have gone up. What's to contribute to that? Narcan. Narcan is actually saving people's lives. That's the good news. And I'm, sometimes I have to bring up the bad news. There are actually 20 new derivatives of fentanyl out on the streets now. They're called nitazines. We had our, I was doing a talk at Frisco High School a few months ago, and I was with Ed Chavez, head of the DEA here, and I just got the autopsy of two 16-year-old girls that had got a little cocaine, and it had one of the nitazines in there. And he said, where was that? And I told him exactly where it was. He said, it's the first case we've had in North Texas. The reason I bring up these nitazines, they're three molecules away from being an opioid. This doesn't work. They're dying, and there's nothing we can do about it. And they're, they're here in North Texas. The U.S. Attorney's got the first case up in Sherman right now to charge this person. We are working with Narcan, or legislation, with a lot of politicians that we're hoping in January this gets put on the bill so that it's not just an SRO and a nurse in your school that has Narcan. It's in every classroom. As I brought up, my son died in 72 seconds, and I've been in some of these high schools that are bigger than colleges. And by the time a nurse gets across campus, it's too late. Um, this is very small. <laughs> um, like I said, Texas Against Fentanyl, the one thing that we do is we go out and speak wherever we can. Um, I've done probably 250 speaking engagements. This will be my second one this week, and I've got three more the rest of this week. We're out there fighting every day, and we're not getting rich doing this. We're not getting paid. We're out there just like you two are out doing, is we're sharing our story. That's the biggest thing that we can do as a parent, is share our story to save the rest of you guys. And we've, uh, I've, the law enforcement, they always tell me the same thing. We can never arrest our way out of this. And prosecutors can never prosecute their way out of this catastrophe. I've been to the border, I don't know how many times. And last year, the DEA alone confiscated 390 million lethal doses of fentanyl in the United States. That's the DEA alone. We're not talking about the local PD, Border Patrol. And we know that's about 10% of what comes across. So I can tell you right now that last year alone, there's 4 billion lethal doses of fentanyl in the United States. That's half the world population. So if you don't think this might not affect you, I bring up football. You know, football's big in Texas. If there were a football field with 100 landmines on it, would you not make your, aware, your child aware of running across that football field? We have to talk to our children. We have to make everybody aware of this issue. These are just, I don't know why I sent the slideshow, but just some of the stuff that we've done. Uh, I've worked with a lot of law enforcement, schools, whatever we can do. Fentanyl on social media. Um, 
this isn't like when I grew up in the 80s, drug dealers were on the corner of the street. It's now in social media. That's where these kids are getting their stuff. And during COVID, how are they getting it? They're getting it delivered to their house. So they didn't have to leave. There's a lot of emojis. We can pass out information on the little signs, the little emojis that are on there. I, like I was telling you guys yesterday, I don't like social media. I think it's not a good thing, but it's our only way to spread awareness right now. And you know, I just, I still applaud you guys. I think you know, every day there's parents like us out there every day just sharing our stories and posting it on the internet. And somebody's going to say, that kid's just like me, just like my kid, because you're saving a life. And that's what we have to focus on every day. Thank you so much for letting me share my story. And thank you, Myra and Oscar, for sharing your stories. We work China's Texas Against Fentanyl to get into every school. And it, it's sad when we first started that we thought, God, will we ever be able to find somebody that maybe went to that school district? Now we're overloaded. We've got more kids at each school district than we can even think of. I get a text every day, it seems like, on Facebook as a new friend, and that scares me to death because it's not somebody who wants to be my friend. It's another family member that's lost somebody. So I just hope you guys can take one thing away, talk to everyone. You can't experiment anymore at all. There's nothing out there that's safe. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's not worth it. We don't get a second chance anymore. So thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you, Mike, for being here, um, as, as well as the Terans. Thank you for sharing your tragedy so that it can hopefully prevent that for someone else. Um, thank you for, for being here and just, just sharing this message with our community. Um, I, th I think a lot of us sometimes don't, don't realize how close to home this hits. And I, and I think, for me, meeting you guys and, and learning about your tragedy just just reminded me how close to my backyard fentanyl is and, and all the other dangers that are out there for our children. So um, I want to thank you all for being here today um, and participating in our Red Ribbon Breakfast.